Hello, I'm Cal Wellborn, agrologist with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, Division of Plant Industry in Gainesville, Florida. Good morning. This morning I'm going to introduce the Ariophyoidea. Ariophyids are the most highly adapted phytophagous mites. They're only second to the Tetranicidae as an economic pest. They're also important vectors of pathogens. As I said, they're modified more than any other plant feeding mites. They've reduced their size. Most areophyids are within 90 to 200 micrometers. Uh, there's a few that are even less than 90 micrometers. They have very complex mouth parts. If you recall, when we looked at the Tetranicoidea, they just have a movable digits, and that's all you have for your, for your mouth part. In the areophyoides, you can have up to seven different stylets associated with the mouth parts. Palps are reduced, and the ketotaxy of the legs and the idiosoma is also reduced. The Ariophyoidea arose independently of the Tetranicoidea. They are an ancient group. Our earliest fossil record for the Ariophyoids is about 200 million years ago, somewhere in that vicinity, and it was from an uh, amber sample. The most primitive Ariophyid, um, Pentacetus Aracaria, Aracaria forms galls on Ericaceae, which is a plant family that originated in the Permian. The Tideoidea, or Tideoidea, is probably the closest living relative to the Ariophyoids. And we have fossil Tideoids going back about 400 million years. As I said, Ariophyids average 90 to 200 millimeter, micrometers Aerophytes average 90 to 200 micrometers long and about 50 micrometers wide. They're smaller than most tarsonemids. They are usually not visible to the naked eye or with a hand lens. There are a few aerophytes that get up to 500 micrometers, but most are 200 micrometers or less. Unlike other phytophagous mites, the feeding of aerophytes can affect plant growth. Many aerophytes are vagrants cause no visible damage. And the only way you can even find them is careful looking at plant material or washing plant material to extract the mites. Other areophyids, the salivary secretions, can stimulate localized plant growth to form irinia, galls, and other deformities. And this is how most people find areophyids. They find the galls, the irinia, or the deformities, whereas the vagrants usually go unnoticed unless you're actually looking for them. Aerophyoids are the primary group of phytophagous mites capable as vectors of plant viruses. We're still in the early stages of learning about the viruses that aerophyoids can, can transmit. Uh, one example is the wheat streak virus, which, attacks, which affects wheat and it is a very serious pest in parts of the Midwest. Aerophyoids are haploid. Fertilized individuals, 2N, become females and Males are one end. The advantage to haploidy is the females are the dispersive instar for aerophyids and most of the phytophagous mites. So an unfertilized female will move, get to a new plant and lay eggs. Those eggs become males, they mate with the female, and then you can have a whole new colony starting. So it only takes one individual, mated or unmated, to uh, create a whole new uh, colony. Aerophyids are host specific. Many, I should say most species, cannot be identified without host data. There are very few keys to species for most aerophyids. The largest genus, Acaria, has close to a thousand species. There are no, key, no keys to the species. You have to know the host. And then you go to the primary literature and see if, you if your aerophyid agrees with what's in the primary literature. The life cycle of the aerophyid is egg. Two immature stages and the adult, we're not sure whether it's a larva and a nymph or two nymphal instars. It hasn't been resolved. Some aerophyids have alternate adult forms, making an aerophyid taxonomy even more confusing. We have the protogyne, which is male and female are very similar. 
and we have the deutogyne, which is a secondary female, and this is the overwintering form. In some cases, the morphology between the deutogyne and the, and the protogyne can be quite significant, making, resulting in some cases where a protogyne might be described as one species and the deutogyne as a second species. In this figure here, the large one here is a deutogyne, the, the three smaller ones are the protogynes. Here's a life cycle of Ariophyes brachytarsus. This lives on a deciduous tree. And the deutogyne is the overwintering stage. It overwinters in buds. In the spring, as the leaves emerge, they ride out on the leaves and start feeding. The feeding, the saliva they're feeding causes galls to form. The deutogyne lays eggs in the galls. They hatch into protogynes, which in this case are different color. Protogynes are active in the summer, and towards midsummer, or in the summer, the protogynes start laying eggs that become deutogynes. Deutogynes exit the galls, overwinter in the, the gall, whereas the protogynes die at the end of the, when the leaves drop. So, so they can have two different morphologies for different times of the year. How many areophytes are there? Well, according to uh, Zhang et al. 2011, there were 4,404 species in 358 genera. That was in 2011. And uh, according to Jim Amarine recently, he's, there's up to 5,700 species of areophytes, which makes it the most numerous of all the phytophagous mites. While we're looking at the three families here, the, phy the phylogeny of the areophytes is not resolved. Some of these families may some of these families are polyphyletic, and it will take time to work out the phylogenetics of the, the areophyids. Dispersal. As with other phytophagous mites, areophyids primarily disperse through the air, but they also disperse through the movement of plant material. Zhao and, and James Am Jim Amarine in West Virginia did a study. Actually, Zhao was the graduate student who did the study. But they collected mite samples daily for one year. They set dishes of water equivalent to about a third of a square meter on the top of buildings about 40 meters above the ground in Morgantown, West Virginia. During this year, they collected approximately 10,000 mites that fell out of the sky into their pans of water. Most of these were area fights. There were tarsinemids, a few tetranicids, and a few other mites. Of those mites, only about 200 could be identified. Approximately 900 new species were represented in these 10,000 mites. The odds are these will never be described, hopefully, because we have no host data. We don't know where they came from. In this study, uh, even, on, even on days it snowed, they had areophyids falling out of the sky. I just give you an idea how, how how many areophytes are out there? Areophyte terminology. Like we mentioned in the tetranicoids, old, there's old terminology and there's current terminology. Uh, here are some of the, the old terms used with the ones on the, on the undercurrent. These are the ones we use now. But basically, the areophytes, they have two pairs of legs. Their legs are. Uh, with the coxa, trochanter, femur, genu, tibia, tarsus. In some groups, they lose the tibia. And they have a few CD on genu, tibia, tarsus. The femur may or may not have CD. Palps are very reduced. The clissary are a compilation of several stylets. Important characters are found on the legs, tarsus leg one. The prominent feature is the solnidian omega which used to be called the claw, and the impodium, which used to be called the feather claw. The, the variation of the impodium, or, of the solenidian, and the impodium are very important characters. In addition, the other CD on the, the, the tarsus of the legs and the genu. We're finding with the low temperature SEM microgasps we've been making, that some of the things that early workers thought were CD 
are actually pro cuticular projections and not CD at all. So there's going to be some revision of what we know about what we, what we call CD and what, what are not CD on aerophiids. Males and females can be distinguished quite easily. The males have a very smooth, gentle cover with a couple of uh, projections on it, whereas the females frequently have uh, striations. The opistosomal cutotaxy is very reduced. We have two C's, or I've C2, uh, D, E, and F. Normally, if you recall from the other mites we looked at, we can have two or three D, E, and Fs. But in the aerophytes, they've lost most of those CD. Again, this is a close-up of the ventral side of an aerophyte. Here's the female genital cover flap. The other characters that are important are the number of CD on the coxal fields of leg two and leg one. Whether well, there's, there's usually a CD on coxal field leg two. Coxal field leg one can have one or two CD, and this is an important character for identification. Also, the scarterization between the coxy is important, whether there's a suture, an observable suture, or not. These are all characters that are used in identifying aerophytes. Here's just some various images of aerophytes to get an idea what they look like. These are all low temperature SEM images. Uh, here's a spermatophore, aerophyte spermatophore. Here's another example of a female genital cover flap. Here's your, your impodium, and then your solnidian here. And here, sometimes it's, it's, it's truncate, sometimes it's rounded, sometimes it's expanded. Here's your prodorsal shield. This is a very important character in aerophyids. The number of CD on the prodorsal shield is important. In, in the aerophyid D, there's zero or two CD on the prodorsal shield. In some of the other families, there are various modifications. The maximum any aerophyoid can have is five. So it's from zero to five CD on the prodorsal shield. And the position of the CD on the prodorsal shield is important for identifying the families, at least at this point. Here you can see the cholesterol stylet. Also, aerophytes can carry spores of plant pathogens, as other mites could do. Here's an example of a different impodium. This particular mite lives on Spartina, which is a salt grass. You wouldn't think to find aerophyids on, on a, in a salt marsh. At least I didn't. Some more examples. Annually, the arrangement of annually on aerophyids is an important character, whether they're, they're thick or thin, whether they have the microtubules on it, whether they secrete wax, uh, and so on. The, the ornamentation of the prodorsal sclerite, the lines, are important characters. Here's another example of solnidia and a very fairly simple impodium. Here's the female. You can see the gentle covers flap with the lines on it. Here's the male. You just have two structures. Some more annually. And another female gentle cover flap. Three families, Phytoptidae. There are about 21 genera, 160 some species, more than that now. Uh, the prodorsal shield has one to five CD. Usually an unpaired VI or paired VE both, never with only one paired SC and never without prodorsal CD. So it definitely has one to five. And in every case, there's a pair of CD in the anterior end of the prodorsal sclerite. Most uh, phytoptids are feed on conifers um, and monocots. There are several that are pests of, of palm trees. Diptylomyoptidae uh, is a smaller group, uh, 63 genera, 450 species. Prodorsal shield has two or no CD. Uh, the SCC is present or absent. Unpaired VIs are never present. In this case, the anathosome bends abruptly down near the base and it appears to be very large relative to the rest of the mite. And the C1 CETA is always absent. Aerophyidae, this is the largest group with uh, over 3,000, almost over 4,000 species. It's a very complex group. One genus, Acaria, which is the largest, has over 1,000 species.
Dorsal shield usually with SCCD, opisthosoma verma, vermiform, annually variable from, from narrow to wide. Number of species secrete wax on the opisthosoma. This will disappear when you put them in alcohol or when you mount them. So wax is, is the only way you really see a good view of the wax is, is when they're, uh, you look at them when they're alive. Coxal fields have one or two pairs of CD. Uh, Cis abertopus is a pest on mango. It causes a white sheen to cover over the upper surface of the leaf. It's been suggested this is a um, protogyne or deutogyne of Assyria. And it remains to be seen. Uh, another main ma major pest is Aculops lacopersi. It's a tomato of not a tomato pet, but a tomato pest. Uh, Phyllocaptruda olivera is a major citrus pest. Here is Aculops lycopersky on tomato. Here is Phyllocaptruda olivera. And this is Phyllocoptes bougainvillea. It causes the, the curling of the leaves on bougainvillea. It's present in Florida. Just some examples of some of the, the galls that aryphyids can form. This is on poison ivy. It also occurs on poison oak. Uh, if you're not allergic to poison oak, it's, it's worthwhile getting, collecting some and opening them up to see all the aryphyids inside. Here's uh, um, on uh, maple. Here's the deutogyne galls and then the protogyne, which occurs later in the summer, the different color. And here are just some, some uh, arania on uh, ribes. Some of the reference for aryphoids, um, Amarine et al. Revised keys to the world of genera is pretty good. Uh, Baker, uh, Kono, Amarine, Delfinado, and Stanzi, 96, aryphoids in the United States. This is, a, this is a picture book. Basically, you look up the host and that provides you with images of the aryphides that have been reported from that particular plant. It's, it's, it's worthwhile, but you have to realize we have a lot more records since 1996. And so a lot of things are not in that book, but it's still a good reference. And the Illustrated Guide to the Plant Abnormalities Caused by Aryphides, uh, this is the agriculture, USDA Agriculture Handbook. This is useful, again, it's a picture book. You look at the host, and then it shows the pictures of the galls or the damage, and then you might be able to identify the mite that way. If you want to know more about the biology of aryophytes, then you go to the Plant Pest Volume 6 on aryophyte mites. Questions? What are some techniques that inspectors could use to differentiate between aryophyte mite um, and fungal damage? There is no easy way to tell the difference. Uh, what I do is I look at it under the dissecting microscope and look carefully for either aryphyte mites themselves, their eggs, or the, the skins. Sometimes you'll find predators in there suggesting there may have been aryphyids in there. But really, there is no easy way. You really have to just look for the mites. How do you differentiate a cuticular projection from a cera? The easiest way to determine whether you have a particular projection or a seta is to look for a cetal base. In some cases on aryphyids, the CD are so small that it's hard to tell the difference between a cuticular projection and a seta. But ideally, you want to look for a cetal base. Otherwise, you have to use uh, electron microscopy to see. How do you quickly differentiate a larvae from adult? The easiest way to tell a larva from adult is look for the fully developed genital region on the adult, whereas a larva will have no genital region at all. 